Hi, this is Joe Jackson. It's January the 13th, 2013. And less than 24 hours ago, I read the following eulogy from my mother, Phyllis Jackson, in St. Joseph's Chapel in Glasgow. This eulogy is for Phyllis Jackson, the woman to whom I wrote a note I placed in her coffin and that said, to the light of my life, the love of my life, and my last link to God. It's also a story I know she would want me to tell in these words because yesterday at 7.20 a.m. I woke and heard her say, Joseph, write my eulogy, don't wing it, which is what I had intended to do. So, like a good boy, I did, as I was told. This is what I wrote. Phyllis Jackson, Gladys Presley, Elvis Presley, Joseph Jackson. Those four names were always inextricably linked in my mother's mind and in mine at a deeply spiritual level. That now. That said, now I can almost hear parishioners and people who love mom say, oh no, Joe's not going to talk about Elvis during his mother's eulogy, is he? He is, but I shall try to be brief. Indeed, the story starts here or hereabouts. One Sunday, roughly 50 years ago, I walked out of this chapel after 11.30 mass, walked across the road and saw in the window of Anne's bookshop a paperback called The Elvis Presley Story. I was only a child, had never read a book, but loved Elvis and needed that paperback. So I bought it, read it, and believe it or not, a chapter titled The Woman Behind Elvis gave me a premonition of today and of my mother's death. I learned from this chapter that his mother Gladys was dead, which made me sad for Elvis. But I also read that after she got ill, Elvis spent a day in her hospital room where, it was said, her spirits were raised by his presence. Incidentally, the same was recently said of me in relation to my mother. But that the next morning at 3.15 a.m., he got a phone call at home to say she died, and that made me cry. Again for Elvis, but also because I was a child who didn't know that Mammy's died. But more disturbing was reading that at his mother's funeral, Elvis wouldn't let go of the coffin, tried to climb into the grave and said, Everything I had is gone. I knew that I loved my mother as much as he loved Gladys, so I sensed that this is how it would be from the day of my mother's funeral. I even began to have nightmares and to live in dread of that day. So anyone gone to the cemetery? Better keep me back from the grave. Chill, I'm kidding, maybe. Either way, fast forward another year to another Sunday when Mum was cooking dinner in the scullery and I was sitting at a table in the kitchen reading another version of the Elvis story from an old Valentine pop special annual. In one of the sketches from that storybook telling of the tale, Elvis, at roughly my age then, is seen sitting on the porch of his home in Tupelo with Gladys, who says, I don't know how I'm going to pay the grocer's bills this month. Seems like we're always in debt. He replies, don't worry, none, Mum. One of these days, things will change. One of these days, things will change. That promise, like a prayer, echoed in my soul. If only because at the time my dad was unemployed and one was struggling to pay bills. So Valentine Pop special in hand, I ran out to the scullery and showed mom that sketched sketch. She smiled and said, So, Elvis and his mammy went through hard times too, did they? I nodded my head, told her, yeah, but I have a great idea. When I grow up, I'm going to be rich and famous like Elvis, and then you'll never have to worry about bills anymore. Maybe I'll even be the next Elvis and buy you a mink coat like he bought for his mum. Me, the next Elvis? I don't think so. But my mother, God bless her heart, responded by saying, Joseph, I am sure you will be whatever you want to be, God willing. I then told her gushingly, Elvis said the same thing, Mum. He said a person can do anything he wants, that if you really try, the good Lord won't let you down. Years later, I'd read that psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud once cited as the source of his self-confidence his mother's pride in him as a child. But that Sunday, I didn't need to be told how blessed I was to have a mother who believed that her son could become whatever he wanted to be. Maybe even a journalist, which had been my original dream. Okay, only one or two more Elvis-related anecdotes, the next of which even led to my first epiphany. 
Fast forward five years. One afternoon I was playing 45s. Mom slipper shoveled her way into my bedroom, but she didn't look at me. This made me feel she must have been crying and didn't want me to see her eyes. Yes, even at that point, we felt each other's pain and we shed each other's tears. I also knew why she had been crying. At this stage, my father had left us, was living in London, not sending money, and only hours earlier, I'd overheard her say, every day I come home, I'm afraid I'm going to see a sheriff's note pinned to the door and we're going to be evicted. We owe Dunleary Corporation 12 pounds. So, I prayed to St. Anthony for a few bob, as Mum and I often did down the back of this chapel. Then I said my favourite prayer at the time, as a kid who incidentally was considering becoming a priest. Most sacred heart of Jesus, I place all my trust in thee. And Jesus, I now believe, although there were many times in my life I couldn't say that because I lost my faith, answered my prayer. Not with cash, but with something more important. Look at it this way. At the time, I was just a kid. I didn't know what words to use to console my mother. But then I seemed to hear a voice that said, why don't you play for your mother the song that gives you hope when you feel all hope is gone? So I asked her to sit on my bed, which she did with her hands covering her eyes and made it look like she was praying. And I played from Elvis's Christmas album, the spiritual, it is no secret what God can do. I hoped mom would hear in particular the verse, there is no power can conquer you when God is on your side. Take him at his promise. Don't run away and hide. And mum didn't hide anymore. As the song ended, she took her hands from her eyes, said, That is so true, Joseph, isn't it? It is no secret what God can do, and he is going to see us through all this, isn't he? Then, my mother smiled. Those words, that smile led to my epiphany, in the sense that I realized that a few simple words, whether sung by Elvis or sent from me through one of his songs, could lift someone's spirit. That memory never left me and later in life helped shape nearly every article I wrote and radio show I presented, most of which I even structured like a gospel song, leading to hope and a sense of spiritual uplift. The same applies to this eulogy. There are a thousand similar memories I could share of Phyllis, Gladys, Elvis and Joseph. But fast forward again, this time to 2007, the year I nearly died, which might have killed my mother. Incidentally, Mom and I never talked about each other's death, we couldn't. But at one point near Christmas that year, I was nearly devoid of all hope. And I said to Mom, you know, sometimes I feel as though I've lost the will to keep up the struggle of life. She responded by saying, Joseph, just remember the stories of all those people you interviewed who had to hit rock bottom before they rose again. Hearing this, I realized that Mum was telling me something like Elvis had said from me to her in 1967 and was even using a metaphor from the story of Christ, that reference to rising again. So again, like a good boy, I did what I was told and not only remembered but reread many of those interviews and my faith in life was restored. That's why in 2011 when Mum was diagnosed with lung disease, then had a stroke. I promised her I would publish and dedicate to her an e-book of those interviews, including a chapter that told her story, and call it, At the End of a Storm is a Golden Sky. The title, incidentally, comes from Elvis's version of You'll Never Walk Alone, which we both loved. Mum also loved the cover of the book, which she and I designed while she was in hospital. And I did finally publish that book last Christmas Day. As it transpires, it was the last gift I gave my mother. But Elvis and Gladys remained an intrinsic part of our story to the end. Last Tuesday, on what would have been Elvis's 78th birthday, I visited Mum in a wonderful nursing home or Lady's Manor. We talked about how hard it was to envisage Elvis Presley at 78, and Mum said, oh, I forgot to tell you that Sister Bernadette played Elvis songs for us yesterday, Christmas songs. I didn't know some of them apart from, I'll be home for Christmas. Then the next night, after a savagely unexpected heart attack, Mum was back in hospital. I was told she might not live 10 hours, wanted to stay with her all night, but she said, no, Joseph, go home, get a good night's sleep. This may have come true, my premonition at the age of eight. 
because that is exactly what Gladys said to Elvis the night she died. And last Tuesday, an hour after my mother said that to me, I got a phone call informing me that she'd had a bad turn. I asked, is my mother dying? I was told she was. But while I was racing back to St. Michael's Hospital, I remembered that I'd said before leaving Mum, you better be here for me in the morning. And she replied, I'll ask God to have me here just for you in the morning, Joseph. Meaning, Mum was saying, yet again, God willing, or to God, not mine, but thy will be done. The words Elvis had inscribed on his mother's gravestone. But here's where, happily for me, the tale of Phyllis Gladys Elvis Joseph diverge. A year or so ago, Mum said to me, sure, where would I want to die, if not in your arms? She got her wish. Last Tuesday at 9.30 p.m., my mother's heart stopped, but she was brought back to life for a time, prompting one nurse to say, your mother waited for you to get back to the hospital before she died. So you see, in the end, I did better than Elvis. I got to hold my mother in my arms. In other words, it is no secret what God can do. And my dread that I might be asleep when she died did not materialize. But what did materialize a day later, as if written by her through me like I sent that song through Elvis to her, was this poem. Mother, they told me you had only minutes to live. So I banished all doctors and nurses from what suddenly became our sacred space, land of grace or Graceland. I knelt by your bed, cradled you in my arms, your face pressed hard against my heart. Then I whispered into your ear, I love you, Mum. Pressed brow to brow, shed my tears into your closed eyes that seemed for a blessed moment to open and see me as if you heard what I had said. Then I placed my mouth upon your mouth and breathed deep into the soul of my being some of your last breaths. Meaning, Mother, those who always said you and I were as one got it wrong. We were one before I was born, and last night, as you lay dying, we once again became one. I am of your heart. Your heart is now my heart. You did not die. You are reborn. And to your heart, I swear to God, I shall be true. Amen.